Amen. Now, in this chapter, Proverbs chapter 8, what we see here, it's, it's a really interesting chapter in the book of Proverbs. You know, the book of Proverbs as a whole deals with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. That is kind of the, the broad overview of, of just the entire book. There's a lot of small sayings, a lot of verses that just give wisdom, right? And here what we see is it's kind of a, a personification of wisdom. And it says um, in verse 12, I wisdom, so this is like wisdom speaking as if wisdom is a person, right? And it goes on for like almost the rest of the chapter. I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way in the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes decree. Just as we're saying, by me, kings reign, you know, by having wisdom, kings reign. So this is, and this is the context, which is why I started off reading this particular um, passage, uh, just so we can get that context. What I'm actually going to be preaching about tonight is pride, the sin of pride and being puffed up and lifted up and having an arrogant or haughty or proud attitude. It's an abomination. It's wickedness, and we need to avoid this, and it's something that can, is an easy thing to, to fall into as a human being, and especially men. Now, anybody can fall into this sin, but I think men have a little bit of a harder time with this than, than women, just the way that we're designed and the way that we're built. But um, everybody needs to be watching out for this. And so the verse that deals with this in this chapter, I just wanted to make sure we get this in context when it says here, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. This is wisdom speaking. It's, it is extremely unwise. Wisdom hates pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth. People speaking things. See, with, with pride, oftentimes, what, what, probably every time, when you have a proud heart, it's going to be coming out with your mouth and the things that you say and the way that you treat people all are affected by the sin of pride. Flip back to chapter 6, if you would. We're going to see how God feels about it. I mean, in this chapter, yeah, that was dealing with, with wisdom, right? With personified wisdom, hating pride. But let's see what God thinks about this. Proverbs 6, look at verse number 16. Proverbs 6, 16 reads, These six things that the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Verse 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And it goes on and on and says the seven things that the Lord hates. And it actually mentions lying twice. But the very first thing he mentions is a proud look. And, you know, you'll have to ask yourself, do you have a proud look about you? Are you someone that, that walks around with this, with this kind of a haughty attitude? With an attitude of, I'm better than everybody else? And because if you do, the Bible says that God hates it. And let that sink in. God's hatred of things. We often throw the word hatred around sometimes. Like, you'd be like, oh man, like zucchini. I hate zucchini, right? Or I hate what, you know, talking about food, talking about, talking about some things. I mean, do you really hate it? I mean, some people, they're going to be like, yeah, I really just despise it and I can't stand it and I hate it. But that word hate is a strong word. It's not just, well, I like that a little bit less. No, I hate it. Now, when we're, we're thinking about God, the things that he hates, we want to make sure we are minimizing and completely getting rid of from our life the things that God hates. How would you like to be walking around on this earth just, just doing things that God's just looking down and be like, man, I hate that. I hate that he's doing that. I hate that. Pride is one of those things. And study out the rest of this verse later and get the rest of them worked out too. But we're dealing with pride tonight. And... All, you know, even in our culture, sometimes people can view pride as a good thing. I'm really proud of this and I'm proud of that. You know, we ought not to glory in anything. If we're glorying in anything, we need to glory in the Lord. That's what the Bible says. If we're going to boast about anything, our boasting should be 
in the Lord, not in our own work and our own merit. It's, it's hey, I'm going to brag on God because He's so good, because He's so righteous, because He does so many great and wonderful things. That is okay because you're not, you're not boasting yourself. You're not lifting yourself up. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 15. Flip over forward to, to chapter 15. Let's see what, how God deals with the proud. Look at verse 25. Proverbs 15, verse number 25 reads, The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Uh, Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. So we see, we've seen already that God hates pride, but look at this. It says every one, every one, every person, every one that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. So think about that. If you're one of these people that walks around with a proud heart, you just think that you're so great, that you're God's gift to men, that you're God's gift to women, or you're God's gift to whoever, that you're just some, some fantastic person, and you have this proud heart about you. And this is what's, what you have to watch out for with the worldly wisdom and the worldly help. They, uh, they have these, like, these self-help books, and they're always talking about your, um, not, not necessarily your confidence, but like your own ego and your own, um, like your, your self-confidence, really. And what they end up doing, and, and I want, again, you got to be careful with the words because they end up taking things too far. Now, you do have to understand that you have value and that you have worth in God's eyes. We all do. I mean, we're, we're priests and kings and princes, you know, like in God's eyes, we are very important. We're his ambassadors. We hold important positions for God. He, he expects a lot out of us. We're his children. We're heirs according to the promise. We have a lot of value. But the difference comes between knowing you have that value and getting puffed up and proud over that value or over anything for that matter. We ought not to be thinking ourselves as better. Because here's the thing. You can have a lot of value, but so does everybody else. Right? God doesn't looking at you and saying, well, you are way more valuable than this person. And that's where you have to be careful and draw on the line with the proud. And, a lot, you know, the world's going to teach you, you got to take care of number one first. You got to take care of yourself. Don't worry about anyone else. You need to make sure you're taken care of. And that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches to esteem other people better than yourselves. Now, it doesn't mean that you think that you are valueless because we have a lot of value. But think about how much more you will you know, esteem other people better if you already esteem yourself out. And that's where self-esteem is what people, is, is the big term that people are looking at. Like, oh, you have no self-esteem. You're not esteeming yourself high enough. Well, However much you esteem yourself, you ought to be esteeming others better than yourself. And that's what you need to be, to be looking out for when, if anyone's ever trying to give you this worldly wisdom. You know, that they, they tell this to people who are depressed and everything else. It's the wrong focus and it's the wrong mentality of you trying to fix your depression by focusing on yourself. If you focus on other people, as the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive, that is absolutely a true statement. And I say this to anyone who's suffering from depression and not feeling good and, not fe you know, and, and they're, they're so worried about, about the situation, whatever they're worried about, whatever reason it is they're being depressed, one way to help get rid of that is to go help other people. Preach the gospel. If you're saved, obviously preach the gospel to other people. If you're not, you need to get saved. But if you are saved, go preach to God. Do, do help. Do things for other people. Help other people out. Stop focusing on your own problems. We need to, because that's just going to make it a, a continual, like a snowball effect. You're thinking, woe is me. Oh, man, I have all those problems. And then you're going to start feeling worse and worse and more and more depressed because your focus is on the wrong thing. We need to co be concerned with other people. Now, um, I kind of got off a little bit on a tangent. 
That's people who are depressed, who have, who have this low self-esteem. Now, I'm not saying we should, we should have, you know, we shouldn't esteem ourselves appropriately. We just need to esteem others better than ourselves. So we understand we have value in God's eyes, but we need to be walking around with the attitude of a humble heart, of a humble spirit, not a proud one that's lifted up thinking that we're better than everyone else. Now, um, we obviously need to be careful about becoming proud. One way that this can happen, and I mentioned this in this morning's sermon when I was preaching about truth, is by way of knowledge. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You know what? And keep a finger in Proverbs. We're going to come right back to Proverbs. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of Proverbs that deal with pride. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And this is, this is something that every, that every believer has to work on, especially the younger ones, the ones that, that haven't been in it as long, that, that are learning and growing real fast and learning all kinds of new things. And, and it's just, you can see how much information so many people don't know. And it makes you think that you are better than them or smarter than them or whatever, just because you've been given this knowledge. People have a tendency to get arrogant about it and to get proud about it. Look at 1 Corinthians 8, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So the way you balance out that knowledge so that you don't get puffed up and just, just real arrogant and proud is through charity. Because charity is when you're loving other people in helping them out to build them up. That's why it says it edifieth. The, the knowledge will puff you up. It can puff you up, but if you need to be helping others to keep yourself humble. You need to be worried and going out and using that knowledge in a way where you're helping other people out and not just having this proud, arrogant attitude of, oh, well, I know so much. And that's also one of the things I've noticed about the you know, people who, who hold to the Calvinistic doctrine. They, they have such a proud arrogance about them, just in general, a stereotype that I've noticed to, to be true in many, many, many cases of people who believe in that false doctrine. And they spend all of this time studying the Bible and they think they're, you know, they're getting puffed up with knowledge, but they're not going out and winning souls. They're not going out and doing the work. They're not going out and helping these other people out. That's what you need is a charity edifieth. And obviously it's a false doctrine. And it's a wicked doctrine, but if you're believing that God's just going to pick and choose who gets saved, why would you even need to go out and do the work? I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. But um, we need to, one of the way we balance the knowledge that we receive is by going out and doing the work and, and edifying and, um, and helping other people in charity and love. Look at the next verse, verse 2, and it says, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So he's saying, you're getting, you're getting puffed up and, and lifted up and, and all of your knowledge is like, you don't even know anything. And that's what most of these people that, that start to get puffed up and think they know so much, literally know nothing. I mean, I've seen, I've seen so many people. They themselves have not even read through the Bible one time cover to cover, yet they're talking about how stupid and ignorant all these other people are that don't know anything about the Bible just because they've listened to some sermons from a pastor who's actually preaching, you know, the whole counsel of God. Now, they're learning a lot of good stuff, but they're letting that get to their head because they're looking around and, and, and comparing themselves among themselves, which is not wise. Comparing themselves among all these other people. And, um, you know, I had a friend of mine even, a really good friend, he didn't have a problem with pride. He's a very humble man. But he even mentioned, you know, he wanted to go out and become a pastor, and he said that, uh, you know, he thought that he was ready based on his experience of, of the, the surrounding and the environment that he was in. And it wasn't until he got an environment around other people who really loved God and really knew the Bible where he was like, whoa, maybe I'm not ready yet. And, and you know, but he had the humility to recognize that and understand, oh, well, I need, I need some more learning. 
I need to get some more teaching. I need to be under someone else before I can go out and start teaching other people. Um, but when you're just comparing yourself against other people, you could think that you know so much. And it, can, it has a tendency to bring out some pride in you. And we need to make sure that, that we are not um, given to this and thinking that we're so smart and, um, and other people are just stupid. Instead, just uh, worry about being able to, to use that knowledge to help people, to, to, to teach them or you know, instruct them, whatever, whatever it is that needs to happen, but doing it in love. Now, what happens oftentimes with an increase of learning and with the pride that goes along with that is fighting. Excuse me, fighting and contention. Turn back, and flip back if you would to Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter 13. I'll read from you. Proverbs 11 verse 2 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. You're turning to Proverbs 13. You see, the, the, the fighting and the contention also comes with a lack of respect for other people. Right? When you think that you're so smart and everyone else is so stupid, you, don't, you have a tendency not to respect those people at all, the people that you're dealing with. And you start to lose respect for a lot of people when you get lifted up in your own pride thinking that you're so great. You become a know-it-all. And without charity, that is what you become. Look at verse 10 of Proverbs 13. The Bible says, Only by pride cometh contention. Contention's fighting. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Flip, if you would, over to Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28, verse 25. Proverbs 28, verse number 25. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. So he's saying, you know, people who, who, are, who are proud and they're arrogant, they go causing fights and stirring up strife. And this goes hand in hand with, with having that proud heart. And um, another reason why we want to avoid it, you know, we ought not to be causing contention, especially within the church. We need to be, to be humble and edifying other people and building other people up. And hey, if someone needs some correction or if someone needs, you know, um, some teaching on a subject, great. But do it in a way that's going to edify them. Or, I mean, if the rebuke is necessary, give the rebuke, but never from pride or from arrogance or from, from thinking that you're so great because when you have that attitude, you're thinking you're better than them. You're not esteeming them better than you. Now, there's different situations that call for different types of reactions depending on what a particular individual might be involved in. If it requires a rebuke, it requires a rebuke, right? If it, but, but, you know, oftentimes that's not the case. They just need a little bit of guidance and direction and we need to, to have ourselves be humble in order to teach others and for them to, to receive it easily because the goal is for them to get right. So we need to have that humble attitude even if you have a lot of knowledge. Don't let that get you puffed up. Um, this was a problem in 1 Corinthians. If you want to flip back over to 1 Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. There was divisions among the, the church at Corinth. And there were some people saying, well, you know, I follow Paul, basically. And I, well, I, I follow Apollos. And well, no, I follow Christ. And, I, you know, and people were all saying these different things. So there was a division going on and, and people were kind of getting in these factions of who that they were following. But um, look at verse number 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? So, 
what happens is basically, you know, people are getting real proud and, and arrogant in the knowledge that they, that they have and saying, you know, because they have these great leaders, right? They have someone like the Apostle Paul. I mean, imagine learning from the Apostle Paul and all the great wisdom and truth and the revelations that he had from Jesus Christ himself and that he's teaching and preaching that, man, you're getting some great knowledge, right? And it's new for you, but then you're going to go turn around to someone else and just, you know, be lifted up with pride and basically saying, well, you're an idiot. I can't believe you don't know these things. Like, you just learned that. And what he's saying here, he's like, what hast thou, in verse 7, what do you have that you didn't receive? So he's saying, look, if you received it from someone else, why are you going around as if you didn't receive it, as if you came up with this, as if this is from you and you've, you're so smart and you have it? No, you learned it from somebody else. And uh, and one of the problems we have in, in, this, in this movement that I've noticed, and the movement is a movement of people who are trying to get back to the fundamentals, resurrecting the fundamentalist aspect of the Baptist church, of people who are going back and not compromising on God's word and going back to literally reading it and taking it for what it says and making the stands and not just believing it, but living it. And it's a great movement to be a part of. And I love it. I'm super excited to be a part of this movement. But what happens is because there's so much of a drastic difference in what we're doing with mainstream Christianity, with, with the vast majority of Christians, even the ones that will call themselves fundamental Baptists, have kind of gotten soft and have gotten a little bit watered down. And, and their doctrine's gotten watered down. And you see this in, in many churches. So people coming out of that or still attending that and starting to listen to this preaching, you know, with the internet and everything else, they're getting this great preaching and great teaching, and then all of a sudden, they're getting themselves lifted up. And I've heard, I've heard multiple people saying, well, I know more than the pastor. And that is such a proud comment to say First of all, how do they know that? Now, if a pastor chooses not to teach on something, it doesn't mean that he's ignorant of it, which is kind of what they're assuming. But then that's what they're saying, well, I'm just smarter than him, or I know more than he does. No. First of all, he probably just doesn't agree with you. That doesn't make him dumber than you or anything else, or you smarter than him. Most, pa the vast majority of the pastors, especially in, in like good, and I'm talking about people in like Baptist churches, good churches. I mean, pastors that are saved, pastors that are preaching flock. Look, they may have other issues. They may have doctrinal issues. But to, to sit there, you know, oh, young Christian that just got saved six months ago and started listening to all his preaching and just go and say, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to rebuke the pastor. I'm going to tell him this and this is wrong. And I can't believe you're believing this and I'm just going to let him have it. You need to humble yourself. Even if, even if your doctrine is right and his is wrong, you need to humble yourself and deal with the pastor appropriately. Don't look at him as someone who's just, well, I know way more than him. You don't know what he knows. It's a problem. Knowledge can puff up, but that's why the edification, that's why the charity is so important. That's why the work of going out and preaching the gospel of every creature and having love for other people and esteeming other people better than yourselves is, I mean, if you're truly concerned about someone else, you are going to try to speak to them in a manner to evoke the change necessary or to, to teach or instruct to, for them to receive it instead of just browbeating someone because you think that you just know it all, and I'm just going to go set them straight. And um, you're going to end up looking like a fool oftentimes when you, when you take that type of approach, especially when, when, you're, when you're a novice, especially. But, um, you know, oftentimes I'll come across some very proud people that will have very strange doctrines out soul winning. And these are the type of people who, it'll be along the same lines. Oh, I, I know more than all these pastors. I've heard someone say, like, like, I've went to these churches in town, and I know more than all those pastors here. They don't know what they're talking about. It's like, really, all of them? Hmm. And then you come to find out, is talking to them a little bit, they've got all of these bizarre, strange doctrines. Yeah, you think you know more than them because you're just deceived and you're believing these, these weird doctrines. Like one of, the, one of the guys I was talking to, 
had said, uh, you know, he believed in this serpent seed stuff. And I preached a sermon about that early in Genesis, you know, a few months ago. And it's just a really bizarre doctrine. And it's not something you get from just reading your Bible at all. It's, it's something that you have to be taught from these weird study Bibles and these false prophets that have these publications out and people reading these other books and not sticking just with the Bible and the Holy Ghost. And, you know, they say things like, well, no church teaches what's right or I know more than all these pastors I've talked to. That's a proud, that's a proud attitude to have. And you're just adding sin upon sin. And, that, you know, it's a sin to forsake the assembling of the, of, the, of the believers. So if you think, just because you think you know more than the pastor, first of all, doesn't give you an excuse for just being out of church among the believers, congregating and assembling yourselves with the believers because church is more than just learning from the pastor. And we've gone over this many times in church before that it's a group of people. We're all here for each other. We have different roles I happen to be filling the role of pastor for this church, but we are all important. We all have value, and we all ought to be here encouraging and edifying other people in the church. That's one of the reasons. If you, if you think that you know more than a pastor and you're just not going to church because you know more than the pastor, what about everybody else? Where is your charity? Your knowledge is puffing you up, but you are not edifying anybody. And you've become proud and vain in your own imagination. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter number 2, verse 18. The Bible reads, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. So he's saying here, he's talking about people who they don't, they believe in these weird false doctrines. He's saying, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Now where does the Bible ever say anything about worshiping angels? It doesn't. Yet there's a lot of people out there, these bizarre false doctrines that'll tell you that, oh, we need to be worshiping the angels. And that's what he's saying. Don't let anyone trick you or beguile you of your reward. Of your, either your salvation or the rewards that God's going to give you. Thinking that you have to be worshiping angels. He says these people, they intrude into those things which he hath not seen. They don't know that. They don't know anything about the angels. And they're just making stuff up. And it says that they're vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. These, this proud heart of people who think they know so much. They invent things and, and they, they just think that that's the truth. And this is a perfect example of that. These people really know nothing at all. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll see the very same thing starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So he's talking about people who are, who are working for other people, servants and masters, and he's saying, look, if you're a servant, you know, Work, for, work for, your, for your boss. Work for that master in, in a righteous way. And if you're a boss, hey, treat your servants well. You know, and, and this is essentially the teaching he's saying. And he says, these things teach and exhort. Teach people to follow this. This is the right way to do things. Look at what he says in verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, so people are saying things contrary to this. They're teaching that, no, that's not the way you do it. And consent not to wholesome words. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Look at this. It says, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, 
railings, evil surmise, surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So he's saying these people, they're proud. They'll be telling you, you know, to treat your employees a different way because he's saying they think that gain is godliness. The more, just the more money you can make is, is like proves that you're some godly person. This is the attitude he says. He says, that person's proud. He says, they don't know anything. They think they know it all. They think, hey, man, this is the way to do it. And they don't know anything. And look what it leads to, as I mentioned before, strifes of words. He says, where have come in envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, and perverse disputings. Disputings, again, it's fighting and arguing and all this stuff. It all comes from the proud man. All these vain fights and arguments and strifes of words comes from the man who's lifted up in his pride. Who doesn't have the attitude of one willing to learn. Even a teacher can have a humble attitude. But the man that's lifted up with pride, they're not going to hear it and they're, they're going to be getting into these fights and strivings. Um, turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. I'm going to read from you from Proverbs 18 because, you know, knowledge is one way that we can get puffed up. We can get, we can get haughty. We can have an arrogant attitude from knowledge. But there's other things that can do the same thing. For example, wealth. And this is probably the most common. We people who have a lot of riches and a lot of wealth, they have a tendency to have a proud heart or a proud attitude because they've worked real hard and they've amassed all this stuff and they have a sense of accomplishment that makes them think that they deserve all these things and that they're so great and they're better than everyone else because they've worked hard for it and they've earned it. Now, working hard and earning stuff is great. I don't have a problem with that, but there's a, the people have a tendency to get lifted up in themselves and too much of themselves um, when that happens. Look at, or I'm, I'm going to read from you from Proverbs 18, verse 11 says, The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and as an high wall in his own conceit. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. He's saying, you know, the rich man, they trust in their riches. They think, oh man, I've amassed myself all of this stuff. And they can, they, in a way, they, they are relying on that and in, in setting themselves at ease because they've accumulated so much wealth for themselves. And that is where their trust and reliance is on their safety, on, on whatever, right? And in some people, it's like their salvation is tied up with, with how successful they've become because they're a hard worker and they've earned all this stuff. And, and they, they suppose that gain is godliness, as we just read from this other verse. But... Um, it says here, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. God's going to bring you low. When you get lifted up in pride, when you get this attitude of how great you are, whether it be because of your riches or because of your knowledge or whatever it may be, God's about ready to destroy you. God's about ready to bring some destruction and say, no, you're going to be abased. I'm going to bring you down to where you ought to be, to where you really are. And you're going to realize you're not as good as you thought you were. But he says, but before honor, and honor would be someone elevating you. Lifting you up, right? Giving you, giving you blessings or looking at you with honor. Before you get that honor, you need to be humble, is humility. Look at Isaiah th uh, chapter 3, because here's another thing that can get people lifted up with pride, is their physical appearance and their beauty. People have a tendency, especially on women. Now, men, men have more of a hard time with the, you know, the proud, I've made all this stuff and I've accumulated all this wealth and I've done all this stuff and I've worked real hard and they're real proud of the fact that they have accomplished so much and, and, they, and they get lifted up and think that they're so great because of all of these accomplishments. Women on the other hand have more of a tendency with their beauty to go around in vanity and showing off their looks. Look at Isaiah chapter 3 verse number 16. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, haughty is another word for proud, they're lifted up, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. 
right now some of this is going to be kind of amusing when i when i read this and um it, there's you know as as we get into this you'll see there's a lot of things i don't even necessarily know what they all are that they're adorning themselves with there's some funny words in here but um you're going to get the picture anyways without having to know the definition of every single thing that's mentioned here but we're already seeing an an, an attitude with the way they present themselves right this stretched forth neck we have a stretched forth neck what your nose is in the air right Oh, I have this stretched forth neck. And their wanton eyes and walking and mincing as he goes, says, making a tinkling with their feet, you know, walking real lightly and in a way that's, that's probably drawing attention to themselves, right? That they're this princess that everybody needs to be looking up to. Verse 17, Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. And the Lord will discover their secret parts. He's, I'm going to bring you to shame. You know, exposing their nakedness, giving them scabs, things that are going to make them, you know, ugly, unattractive, and, and just, just bringing them to shame because of, the, because of their haughtiness, because of their pride. Look at verse 18. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls and their round tires like the moon. Now, I don't know what they do with the round tires, but um, let's keep reading here. Verse 19, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers. And mufflers, I don't think it's like a muffler on the car. It's got to be some other thing. I mean, look, we're seeing chains. We're seeing bracelets. They're adorning themselves with all kinds of jewelry and decking themselves out, right? And really just, just, just playing up the, the physical just the, the image that they're presenting, right? In their pride of, of how beautiful all of this stuff is and look at me. That's the attitude that we're seeing here. Verse 20, the bonnets, so their hats, and the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands, and the tablets, and the earrings, and the rings, and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the mantles, and the wimples, I don't know what a wimple is, and the crisping pins, the glasses, and the fine linen, and the hoods, and the veils. That's a lot of stuff, okay? I don't know what all of those things are, but it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of accessories. And he's talking about these women, they're haughty, and they're just adorning themselves with all of this stuff. And the Bible teaches us that, look, you know, the, the, the inward man is what we need to be focused with. And if you're a woman, the inward woman, right? It's, the, it's not the outward adorning and braiding of hair and, and all these other things. It's the, the, the good works and, and what's on the inside and, and being a righteous woman is what you need to be focusing, not on this whole outward appearance. And, and women that are haughty will have a tendency to just be flashy. And I'll call it immodest. Modesty deals, it's not just with the uh, how much um, skin you're exposing, right? That's the way we have a tendency to think about modesty is when women are showing off too much of their body. That's immodest, right? And I think everyone would agree with that. But really, the modesty is, is drawing attention to yourself. That's, that's immodest when you are doing things that cause people just to be looking at you and making yourself the center of attention. So that's why also putting on all this expensive jewelry and gold and you know, rings and nose jewels and just, just everything, right? Decking themselves out, it's looking at, you know, hey, everyone, look at me. Hey, everyone, look at, look, at, look at how beautiful I am. Look at how many things I have. Look at how attractive I am, whatever it may be. That's a haughty attitude, and that is immodest. And that is not the way a godly woman ought to carry themselves. But you've got to be careful. Beauty can make you vain, and beauty can make you um, become proud and arrogant and haughty. And, you know, you've probably dealt with this, you know, most people have, if you've, you know, growing up just in, a, in a, group, a large group of people, like in a public school or something like that, you know, the, 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 the more attractive women have a tendency to be a lot more proud and arrogant and treating people like dirt and whatever than other people. There's just kind of an attitude that, that they get, and that's a wicked attitude to have. And God hates that attitude. You know, people thinking that they're better than everyone else because... They've been blessed with long, beautiful hair or like a, a, a nice figure or whatever, whatever that may be, right? The beauty is vain. And 
don't let that, if you are someone who's been blessed with, with, with good looks, that you don't let that get to your head. That you can be humble and esteem others better than yourself and not think that you're so much better than other people because you've got these great looks. Pride has consequences. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 16. Pride comes with its consequences. And this is why I'm preaching about it. This is important for us to learn from this, that we don't ever get sucked into having a proud heart. It makes God angry, as we've seen earlier. God hates it. To look at us when we get prideful because we have no reason to be proud. We really don't. and we're, we're all just wicked sinners. We have to view things from God's perspective. We can compare ourselves like the person who has a lot of knowledge, compare ourselves among all these other people and think that you're so smart, right? Because you're comparing yourself against some other people who are ignorant, maybe. And, and you just think that you are just so smart, so that lifts you up with pride. God looks at you and you're like, you're a fool. There is so, like, you know nothing. You know nothing, that's from God's perspective, right? We need to make sure we have a refresher of God's perspective on everything. As with these, these, the, you know, these ladies in uh, the Daughters of Zion in Isaiah 3, God's like, oh, you think you're so beautiful? I'm going to give you scabs, and I'm going to uncover your nakedness, and you're going to be ashamed. That's what I'm going to do. That's the way I, I hate seeing this. He hates seeing it because... We are not worthy of lifting up ourselves, no matter who you are, above anybody else. Everybody is of the same value here. Jesus Christ is the only one worthy of being able to say that, that He has accomplished something that no one else has. Because He was perfect. He was without sin. So He was better than everyone else. That's why He has a name that's above all names. And that's why we bow down unto Him. Because at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. That will happen because He is better than everyone. But among us, we have no reason to lift up ourselves with pride. It makes God angry. You're in Proverbs 16. Look at verse 18. The Bible says, Pride goeth before destruction and in haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So he's saying it's a lot better for you to be humble with people who are lowly, people who don't have a lot of stuff. It's way better to be humble with the lowly than it is to, it says, to divide the spoil, to get all these riches and all these goods with all these proud people and be, and be a proud person and just have all this increase of wealth. He's saying it's way better to be humble and with the lowly because... Pride goeth before destruction. And you're going to face that destruction if you're a proud person. Look at Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 23, reads, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Your pride, God will rectify things. When you are letting yourself get up and think that you're so mighty and you're so great, God's going to, Balance the scales. He's going to bring you back down. He did that with Nebuchadnezzar. If you remember that, Nebuchadnezzar got so lifted up because what happened was is that God was bringing His judgment upon the nation of Israel and upon a whole bunch of other nations. So He used the Babylonians to go and to bring all these people into captivity and to conquer them and that they were suffering under the hands of the Babylonians. And God's the one that made that to happen. But what did Nebuchadnezzar think? Look at this great kingdom that I built. He was lifted up in that pride, thinking that he was, because he is such a mighty, great, smart king. You know, he accomplished all of this stuff and gave none of the glory or credit unto God, who's the one who really caused that to happen. So what happened to, to Nebuchadnezzar and at the height of his pride? God brought him low. God made him, he gave him the heart of a beast, the Bible says, and that he was outside eating the grass of the ground like an ox. And 
was outside and you know in the dew from heaven and he was out like just 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 out in the elements his fingernails were just growing long like like birds claws and his and his hair had kind of gotten all ratty and knotty like like feathers and he turned into like a beast because God had to humble him and then when all of that happened when he finally was done with that he was like okay God deserves the credit. You know, there is a God in heaven and he could lift someone up and he could bring them down. You know, God's the Lord. And, and that, that humility brought him to God. And oftentimes we need that type of a humility to be brought to God. Um, that's actually one of, the, one of the problems with pride. There, there's, um, it's one of the ill effects that it can have on a person's life is it oftentimes will keep people from getting saved. Because you need to be humble to recognize that no matter how great you think you are, no matter how good of a person you are, no matter how many people you've helped, no matter how many animals you've saved, no matter how many sins you haven't committed, and compared to everyone else, you are just some, you think you're such a great person, you have to let go of all of that and say, none of that is going to get me to heaven. Because I actually deserve hell. I think I'm so great, but I actually deserve hell. The proud person does not think that they deserve that punishment of hell. They think that they are too good for that. They think, well, I've made some mistakes, but I've done so much good that I don't deserve hell. I'm so much better than hell. like these murderers, these drug dealers, man. I'm so much better than them. That pride if they can't humble themselves and just receive that free gift where you do nothing to earn it, you just receive it because it's bought and paid for already. When you just receive that, that's, you need that level of humility to accept that. To accept that someone else did it for you. Someone else paid the way for you. And that's the only way you can make it. You have no hope of getting there on your own. No hope. You have to receive a free gift. And unfortunately, pride is sending people to hell today because they cannot accept that salvation is a free gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. God made sure we cannot brag about our salvation. I cannot tell you, oh yeah, well, you know, I pastor a church. I pray every day, three times a day, actually. I read my Bible. I study my Bible. I help people out. I give money to the poor. I don't drink. I don't smoke. And I'm going to heaven because I'm so great. That says, no. You're wicked. You're a sinner. You, you, deserve, you deserve to burn in a lake of fire forever and ever and ever, and ever, and ever, and it never is going to end. That's what you deserve. You deserve torture and torment because that's the level you've attained to. Oh, wait, you've broken my law? Yeah. You think you're great? You're not. You have no reason to be proud and lifted up. But I love you. I'm going to save you. Just accept this free gift and humble yourself and realize you can't do it and accept this gift. That's, that's all it takes. But unfortunately, pride will keep people from getting saved. Oftentimes, pride will keep people from changing what they believe. Pride gets in the way of that. It's, it's, it's maybe they've been taught a certain way for their whole life. And, well, these people can't be wrong. Or they're trusting in a man and say, well, that person can't be wrong. There's no way that person could be wrong. And they won't, they won't change when, when confronted with the truth. Uh, pride keeps people from getting right doctrine, especially if it's new to them. Um, and I think pride can even be a problem for older people more often than for younger people because they get set in their ways and have a hard time thinking that they have been wrong for so many years. That can be pride too. Say, well, I've believed this way for all these years. You mean to tell me I'm wrong? It could be a hard pill for, for the proud person to swallow. As opposed to the person who, as I was talking about earlier, is just, is just 
concerned with the truth. See, we ought, we ought to be able to take something that my five-year-old says, if it's true, it doesn't matter the source that she's five years old and I'm 38. If she says something that's true, that's biblical, that's, that's from God's word or whatever, she says something that's true, if, it's, if, if I believe different, I ought to be able to receive that even from the mouth of a child regardless of, of this, you know, this fact that I'm her dad, I'm supposed to be teaching her. If she says something that's true and I'm wrong about it, like I ought to be able to accept that and not be so proud as to say, well, pff, you know, what do you know? What do you know? Now, there's going to be a lot of instances where she doesn't know, you know, and I need to teach her, obviously, that with, with that. It's a pretty extreme example. But my point is just that if there is something that's said that, that a child can bring you that's knowledge that you didn't have before or knowledge that's, that's contradictory to what you've believed, but it's true and it's right, the source shouldn't matter. We ought to be able to recognize the truth for what it is. And, um, you know, in 1 Timothy 4, you don't have to turn there. 1 Timothy 4.11, uh, this is Paul's epistle to Timothy. He says, these things command and teach. He says, let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity in spirit in faith and purity. He knows. You know, he's a, Timothy's a younger preacher. He's saying, don't let people despise your youth. But the way you combat that is by being the example, by living what you're preaching, by doing these things the right way. Be an example of the believers in your word, in your conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, in all manner of your life. Be the example that should speak volumes and should get people to look past the physical number of years you've been alive on this earth. Because it's that example, it's that truth that matters. It's, it's teaching, and he says, command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. And the reason he says that is because older people have a, have a hard time listening to a younger preacher or a younger person trying to explain that, yes, in fact, they have been wrong. Maybe they have been taught wrong by their parents from the time they were a child, from the church they grew up in for 50 years or whatever. They may have been wrong about it. Don't let that pride just say, well, I can't change because this is the way I've been taught for all these years recognize the truth and be able, be willing and ready to change if that's the case. Now, um, if you truly want to be lifted up, you can't bring that honor on yourself. Just like I preached on with the, with the ordained elders sermon where, you know, even Jesus Christ didn't bring the honor on himself. It was bestowed upon him. When you receive honor, it's not something you do of your own. It's someone else has to give that to you. So if you do want to be lifted up by God, if you do want to be someone who's important to God, who is someone who's above maybe other people, right? If that's your desire, you need to make yourself of no reputation. That's what Jesus Christ did. He made himself of no reputation. You need to be a servant and minister unto other people because that's the way God will, will reward you and value and give you more, say, more rewards than other people. That will get you a stat, an elevated status in the kingdom of God. But you have to be humble now. You have to work for other people before you get to that point. Before honor comes humility. You can't achieve this on your own. You can't just grab it yourself and just take it proudly. You need to humble yourself and work for others. Matthew 23 is the last place. We'll turn. I'm going to close with this point, this last point about um, you know, God seeing your humility and your labor, and He'll be the one to lift you up in due time. Matthew 23, verse 8 says, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. He's talking about these titles that people have that, that 
will bring honor and, 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 and respect and everything else that goes along with these titles. Like, oh, I'm a, I'm a rabbi. I'm a master. I'm a, you know, and, and these men giving themselves these titles of, of authority or of honor. He says, don't be called those things. Don't call yourself names. He says, there's one master. And these are names that, that belong to Christ. They don't belong to just regular men. He's saying, don't call yourself these things because Christ is worthy of these names, not you. But look what he says in verse 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. Abased means you're brought low. That word base, like the base of a building, the bottom, you will be abased. You'll be brought low. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Don't worry about your position now. God will take care of it all. If you could humble yourself and, and serve others and minister unto others and say, yeah, but it's not right. You know, these people, they don't even care. I, you know, I do all these things for them. I bend over backwards and they don't seem to care at all. And I just want a little bit of credit for what I do. God can see the score. Don't worry about it. Don't get upset about it. Humble yourself. Let the people, if, hey, if they're going to run all over you, let them run all over you. It's fine. In due time, God will reward you and lift you up for that. Don't worry about getting, making, think, making sure everything is, is working out right and you're getting recompensed, your even reward for what you're doing right now. Hey, and if you're wronged, be, be glad about that. Just go ahead and, and, and don't let yourself get bitter, especially over brothers and sisters in Christ, that they're not recognizing the work you do enough or something like that. Look, don't let that get your heart bitter because if that ever happens, God sees it. He sees it. He sees your humility. He sees the work that you're doing. He'll take care of you. And that's a blessing. That's, and that's something that, that you can just take comfort in. And it, you, don't have to, you don't have to be bitter. You don't have to, to be upset with people. Just, uh, just be glad and thankful that God's a, a just God and you just continue being humble and in due time, God will lift you up. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for your words. We thank you for the, these words of warning, dear God, of, of getting lifted up with pride, becoming haughty and arrogant, whether it be through knowledge or riches or beauty, dear God, or any other vanity of this world. God, I pray that you would please help us all to maintain a humble spirit, and especially in a way where we don't have to be brought down low because we've gotten ourselves proud. God, help us to be able to just read these words and make sure that our heart is not, is not proud because we know that, that you hate a proud look. We know that you will, will bring the proud to destruction, dear Lord, and um, we don't want to have any part with that. I pray that you would please just help us to... to Accomplish this by maintaining our focus on other people, by being worried with the welfare and well-being of others, um, and, and using charity to balance out our knowledge, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.